Taking a picture. <laughs> nice. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Framing Podcast. And this week, really excited. We have two amazing people in the Blab conversation with me. Uh, Marie Poulin out of Vancouver, who is a digital craftswoman, digital strategist, all around genius, uh, builds online schools. Uh, what else does she do here? Mentorship program strategy and delivery. One of the most amazing things they have going on right now, her and her partner, Ben, have created something called Doki. And I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the show. Uh, but be on the lookout for that. Uh, also joining the wonderful conversation today is my man, JP, Jeffrey. Is it Potvin or Potvin? How do you Pot, well, it? you could do the French way. It's Potvin. It's French, but Pot or you can say Potvin. All right, Pot do... and vine, right? Potvin. Jeffrey Potvin, if you are, <laughs> is the CEO and founder of a company called Hardboot Inc. They build custom software and product solutions, project management for companies everywhere from Toronto, New York, Pakistan, and even the Philippines. So these two are very seasoned entrepreneurs that uh, have a lot of have had a lot of success and really know a lot about how to say no when it comes to certain things in business and what are you cutting out and are you going to be losing something and this whole notion of fear of missing out and but what if you never know like it's very common in canada everyone's like oh you never know so these two know what to cut out and what makes a difference in actual to actually grow your business and have things work so i thought we would start uh with a funny video from ellen that is talking about formal and how that we won't show recordings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't show the recordings. Okay, yeah. Ellen is great. And I will post a link to that video in the side so you can see that uh, after the recording. But yeah, what do we, uh, FOMO business? Uh, it's, it's very, very common. How many people feel this need and this desire to, especially when someone is starting out. So we'll start the conversation yeah. with that. Let's look at when you first start your business or you're starting up your company and like stuff's going on and you're just like, I got to get out there and network. I've got to go to this. And I've got to go to that. And you're running around and you're not actually doing your business. So have any of you done that? Or awesome. even just like tools, right? Like, oh, I'm going to need that tool. And like, oh, even like oh, Snapchat's a thing. And just right. uh, kind of discerning which things are actually a good use of your time in the beginning, I think, is uh, is pretty tough. Yeah. So which tools did you start using that you're no longer using? Oh, no longer using. Um, yeah. Like stuff you thought you needed or you bought something. Like, have you ever purchased something like that? Like, what about you, Jeffrey? Have you ever? Well, it's different because when... I started 10 years ago. There wasn't so much, social media wasn't obviously such a massive component. Invented it. Them, right? <laughs> it was kind of invented, but not, not as yeah. much as it's going through now, right? So it was like Web 2.0 at that point was the name exactly. of it. Exactly. Like, like, There's yeah. some pretty bad sites and all that good stuff, oh, yeah. right? Mobile was just starting to t take off a little bit and that kind of thing. Maybe it was a few more years. But um, so we used a lot of different products that had come out at the time, but I, the networking part was key. Like it was, you were everywhere. And you tried to be everywhere because you didn't know what you're like, you don't know what you're going to miss. But right. as time started to progress, what I found that became more interesting is that once you kind of had that grounding, then that's when things started to change. And you're like, well, you know what? I don't need to be out five days a week or seven days a week <laughs> because <laughs> I, I have forgot to do a proposal. I forgot to do this. And now I got to hire 10 people just because I can't keep up with what I didn't do. So I think he, now that there's so much attention to everything that's going on, you're like, oh, I missed that great event or oh, I should have been at this one. So I think that it's totally shifted so much from the beginning of when I started to now, um, which doesn't mean that I'm out to every event. It's not the case at all. I'm kind of more like uh, Ellen. So you, you're clicking your spots, right? You're like, okay, I need to be at that one, but I don't need to be at these other five, right? So. And what is it? And this is a question for both of you. Like, what is it that you're using to discern that this is what I'm going to go to and I'm going to walk away from this. Like, and, and again, think about somebody who is, who's just starting out. I know we have people here from uh, digital strategy school and some people are new to entrepreneurship. 
most of us have been in the game 10 plus years. So now we're just like, nope, yes, no. Like it's sort of automatic. Like our gut has been tuned, right? Yeah, we're sort of like, who, who's, no, no, I'm not. They're like, oh, whoa, whoa, why would you say that? You'd be like, no, that's not gonna. And then it's Almost fun. like we're celebrities and we're like, no, we can't go to that party. Well, it's more of like, we know but which party. Not there, I'm not going, he's not gonna be there. <laughs> well, that's the first obvious step. If I'm not on the <laughs> list, featured, it's, like, it's a no go right off the bat. But I want us to slow down and really think for a minute about what are we actually using to discern that this is a yes and this is a no? That's so tough because I think it's a gut. I do think mm -hmm. it's, a, for me, a very intuitive gut thing, but I think you you almost don't know that. Like your gut isn't tuned in until you've made a few mistakes along the way and you're like, oh, right, that didn't feel right. <laughs> or like that event was a waste of time. Why was it a waste of time or, right. or that sort of thing? So I think uh, in the beginning, if you're not super, super clear on like, what do I want to be known for? Like, I think it's taken me a long, long time to answer that question. So mm -hmm. if, if you don't, if you don't even know what you want to be known for, you're, it's like you're throwing spaghetti at the wall and you're like right. figuring it out as you go. So I do think there's some of it that has to happen that way. Like you kind of have to test the waters in the beginning and kind of like listen to your, your gut about what's, what's feels aligned. And, right. and what doesn't. So tell me about a bad experience you've had going out to an event. You went, that was just, not <laughs> worth my life. Like I'll never get that yeah. time back. I went, it doesn't... One, I went to one a few years ago. Um, I think a friend invited me and it was like a, it was sort of like a women's networking group. Um, I think that was maybe the problem is like, if I'm, if I'm networking, I'm doing it in a way that it's not positioned as networking. Like I go to conferences to meet people. I go to workshops mm -hmm. to meet people. Um, but to go to like a networking event, uh, mm. That might that might work for some people, but uh, I I'm not just going to an event to like hawk my business or to like you know spew out <laughs> business it's cards. Business card yeah, yeah. Like, so it, it just felt like every every presentation felt like a business pitch, and right. um, even the advice didn't necessarily resonate with me, and it was much more speaking to people that worked in a corporate environment. So even just that of like, oh, who is the audience meant to be? It's not for freelancers or or people that are self-employed. It's meant for people in a corporate environment. So that right. was one where I'm like, right, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm in the right audience. Right? Very good distinction. So understanding who's attending the event uh, is, is a key factor. Jeff? What I think too is that while you're trying to figure out if that is a key event for you to attend and the key people that are there and, and everything that's based around it. I think at the beginning, you're really excited to go out and talk about what you do. And I think that's a lot of those events that usually take place is that that's what it is. It's a talking space yeah. and it's all business. And I think the key to anything that's in business is that it's personable. When you make something personal, you will walk away with something more exciting than when you started. So I think when I first learned was that all these events I'd go to, and, and this is when I worked at Loblaws and whatnot before I went on to be an entrepreneur, I went to every event. I was on the row team. I was on the cooking team. I was on everything because I wanted to meet people. <laughs> right. I wasn't selling anything, but I just wanted to meet people because right. one day I said, I'm going to need some sort of attention from these people, not knowing that I was going to start a business, but I just felt I needed that. And then as time went by and I started going to these events when I was on my own, um, I started to realize that everybody just wanted to talk business, but nothing ever came out of it mm. after. So I started to learn that. And I think my approach after started to be, I'm not going to talk about business. I'm just going to go in and be personable. And eventually one day someone's going to turn around and be like, I met this guy. I think he owned a software company and I think I'm going to reach out to him. And oddly enough, 10 years later, we get a lot of referrals just from that. Like we had one for a project not too long ago and a guy reached out and I talk, talked to him four years ago. Wow. We just had coffee and I was like, here, I'll help you with this. And I gave him some ideas and that was it. Right. And then, you know, four years later, he's like, I remember you and I needed some help. And, you know, that's kind yeah. of interesting is that it was so personable that it made a bigger shift than always just talking about business and trying to sell what you have when you could just sell yourself, which is just being personable, I guess. That, that's such a great point just about how those relationships, uh, like you just never know how long that can take like they may not need your services right now but when they are you're the person that they remember because you've sort of been top of mind right so it's just not looking at it as like go to an event and then you know expecting results right away it's just building relationships over a long long period of time so Absolutely. it's uh what's who said this uh people never remember what you do they remember how you they, you make them feel I think it was Maya Angelou that said yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and it, and it was, yeah, that's perfect. And it was, I mean, both of you have demonstrated that. That you got there and you're like, 
forget what I want. How are you doing? What's up with you? Getting more interested in that person than you are about what you're doing. Uh, I thought of something as you, you were both talking about business cards. How many business cards do you walk with when you go to a networking function or you're going to a conference or a workshop? Do you walk with any? Do the real answer or the... Uh, oh, I want... Oh, this is... Drink. I mean, we're drinking on here. Yeah, this, I'm drinking hot Coke. <laughs> <or red. laughs> the real answer. Probably, you walk with probably should cards. carry a lot, right? But oh. I never do. I never no, do. I only just got business cards printed this month. Wow. And yep. I would... I've had business cards over the year. And every year or so, I would change them. And I get them. I get them printed. I get my shiny new card. And I get excited about it. But then... The last set ran out probably a year ago. Just haven't got new ones printed. And you meet people like, where's your card? I'm like, I don't have a card. Give me your card. Let's connect give right me, on give LinkedIn. Give me your Twitter account. Give yeah. me your Twitter account. I'm going to connect. These are mine right here. <laughs> you walk with that in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. They've been sitting on the counter. I just never like, oh, yeah, it's terrible. They've been but... there for months. You're like, look at this. But I mean, yeah. I've got them. But <laughs> Google me. <laughs> you know, they're back at the office. If you just want to come up to me for about 15 minutes, we could. <laughs> but no, like I connect with people right away on LinkedIn. I say, what's your LinkedIn? And it's like, bam, I'm like connected right on the spot or it's Twitter or it's something that's a little more immediate. So I found that uh, don't even carry business cards. And when I did, I had a strict policy of carrying a maximum of three. Oh, that's interesting. So you're, for you're actually forcing yourself to be extremely discerning about who gets that card. Absolutely. I mean, you go to a networking function, you have yeah. three cards. I'm like, hi, how are you doing? Tell me what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you're I'm not getting this one. I was like, no, you're not card worthy. That's not going to be So I would, that's I do smart. that because I, I tend to be a shy person. You know, it's like I go out in the room and I'm like, okay, what's going on? You know, I'm. Liar. <laughs> But I'm really, at heart, I am just like this scared little bunny rabbit just going, oh my God, would someone like me? So I really put that that in place to inspire myself and motivate myself to really get out there and shake a few hands. I call it shaking hands and kissing babies. I'm like, hi, how are you doing? And keep the focus on them. Like, forget about myself. I'm like, tell me more about what you're doing, Jeffrey. Tell me more about what's happening. Like, I want to know what's going on. Like, could we go for a beer later on? And it's like, if I can't go for a beer with you or actually do business, great meeting you. Yep. Thanks for the card. And I beeline. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the pocket, oh, keep it great. going. Yeah. And just, you know, meet a few people. Sometimes I come home with three, but whenever I do give that card out, I said, there's going to be an interaction with it rather than just showing up and just being like, yeah. hey, everybody, here's a card. Leave some on the table. You never know. I'm like, I know nobody has gotten business like that ever. So... I really like that idea of just caring about the other person. Uh, I want to mention everybody's in the room. If you do have questions, please post them on the side. Or if you want to jump into the seat and join the conversation, we would love to have you. Or you want to share something on social, go for it. We love it. So let's move this conversation into a little bit more about uh, business. Uh, you've both been in the business for a number of years. You've gone through different project life cycles. I mean, you're doing project management, Jeffrey. Like what, how, when it comes to business, how do you decide what it is that you're doing? Because it's one thing to network and move around. Like when it comes to your actual day-to-day -day, than the nine to five or like the nine to midnight, <laughs> which is more like it for the entrepreneur. It's like, how do you decide what you're doing and when you're doing it? Or do you decide? You just kind of are you just winging this thing? <laughs> I think there's always an element of some element. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I mean, I've had to start, um, you know, and you, I, you've mentioned my post on this before, like the designing your ideal week. Like I needed to do that because I needed to give myself some forced structure, you know, and, and having like non-negotiable days where um, you're entirely focused on your own business and no appointments and that sort of thing. So right. um, I feel like I kind of have to like trick trick myself into following some kind of uh, structure to force myself to be um, just making sure I'm making time to like design my business and not just be in in the work, right? And I want to show the multiple alarm clock. You're tricking yourself to get up and you just set it every ten minutes. <laughs> <It's new. laughs> kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, you're like, but if so I set I, it for six, I'll never know that it's not <laughs> six. It's really eight or whatever it is, right? Yep. So I hear you. What, you do. 
what I want to do is show everybody what Marie is actually talking about. She wrote an article about this and I'll share my screen with you. Maybe you could just talk us through your actual structure for your week. Well, the cool thing to look at this too is how much has changed since I did this over a year, I mean, almost a year and a half ago um, that I wrote that article. So it's, I feel like it's always a work in progress, this structure, but basically um, I was inspired by a post that Michael Hyatt wrote on theming your days of the week. And, um, and, and you, you know, you can see in the code, like non-negotiable things. So you actually start by putting your non-negotiables in first, right? So the things that uh, keep you alive, the things that you need for your own sanity, you know, for me, that's like climbing and um, I've got dinner with Ben, you know, walking the dog, all that stuff that is mandatory for your sanity um, that goes in first instead of like putting that in last in between all of your your business stuff so always start with the most important stuff um shower dress and eat <laughs> <laughs> like, and that is, okay and i'll clarify this is an ideal week this is not my actual week this is like a guideline for that structure do i actually wake up at nine o'clock and and shower dress and eat no that does not have you know sometimes, <laughs> sometimes i'm rolling out of bed at 10 o'clock if i don't have any appointments so it gives me some structure but it's also not so rigid that there isn't some some flexibility there yeah. um and for example tuesdays are now a totally non-negotiable day that nothing gets booked no client meetings no nothing that's like content development that's working on doki um, that's my focus days and um, there's a really great book by Cal Newport called Deep Work. And he talks a lot about uh, that's going to be the, the missing skill of the future is the ability to do deep, focused work. Because we are so distracted, right? And like that whole fear of missing out, what's happening on social, like, um, you know, it's like you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off and you don't really get that time to, to really give yourself that like a three hour block. Like how often do we take even a three hour block to write something without a whole bunch of other tabs open? So Tuesdays are my day to like really try to get into that zone and, and make that happen. But it's all like ideal work in progress. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's that, that notion of it being flexible. Like you create this structure and you start going with it. And should you need to change things, you've given yourself enough room to actually do that. What I do notice about this entire schedule is how little time is dedicated to email. Again, in an ideal world. <laughs> in, an, in an ideal yeah. world. But I mean, you have 9.30 to 10, you know, to check your email. And then six o'clock in the evening, <laughs> checking email. So you ideally would be checking email twice a day. In an ideal world. I mean, I'm still I'm still guilty of having, you know, hundreds of unread uh, or read emails that haven't been processed in my inbox. So I feel like email is like a constant, uh, it's yeah. a constant battle to like, come up with a system it's, for that. It's like in tennis with 200 people. I said, you send one out, this is like, oh my God, man. It's like, you can't get on top of this thing. Yeah. So I, I remember sort of Ricardo years ago used to do that. You used to tell me that you wouldn't uh, email between this time and this time. So I actually stopped emailing you. And then you were telling me you wouldn't text between these times. I'm like, this guy's gonna be the hardest guy. I'm gonna have to send some smoke signals to get a hold of him. <laughs> but you're right, it's the best way to balance out your life is to is to sort things into buckets. And those yeah. buckets are are it's what make you boundaries. more efficient. Right? Yeah. And they create boundaries. Yeah, it's it's not about not being available, it's just not being instantly available. Exactly. So I could yeah. respond to something. Uh, you may send me an email like, hey buddy, let's go for a beer on Friday. I'm like, I don't need to respond to that now. I could respond at six o'clock this evening. That's still two, three days before we have to go, and it's perfectly fine. And so with, I've just I, realized. I'm gonna... Oh, go ahead. Go for it. Oh, just with clients too. I mean, um, having some kind of mechanism or a document or something that when you start working together, it's like, hey, client, like be aware of my office hours or if Tuesdays are my sort of non-negotiable days where I don't respond to anything, letting them know like, hey, you know, I, 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 you won't get a response from me on Tuesdays. You know, I take that to do my deep focus work. Um, my office hours are Mondays, Wednesdays, whatever. And just being really clear about your clients with when you're going to hear from me, when you're not going to hear from me. So in a way, it's that's a different way of saying no with clients is just here's when you can reach me and here's where you're probably not going to hear from me. Right. You're not going to hear from me on a Sunday at eight. You know, it's sometimes what I would do is even compose an email or respond to something. Um, and then, yeah, I would use either Boomerang yeah. if I'm in Gmail. Uh, I have a great app on my phone uh, called Spark that allows me to just send this email away for an hour, two hours, 
or tomorrow or bring it back in a month and it'll just show up in my inbox again as if it just arrived that yeah. day and then i can process because i'm just like this is friday this is the weekend this is the weekend this is the weekend i'll do this later now. later later it's just like, yeah it's like yeah. later 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 and then on saturday i'll get you know a bunch in my inbox and i could sit there and do whatever if i have some free time between baby and whatnot but yeah. uh i found that to be processing email rather than living in it yeah. to be significantly important in staying on top of everything yeah and it's interesting too one of the things that we've done over the years inside of the business is that when it because it's a little bit different when it's a uh, in a development environment we try to ensure that the developers are more focused on obviously the development side so we really do try to keep them out of the mix of the emails so and, and it would probably be fascinating to go in and ask one of them like how many emails do you get a day versus the project managers or BAs I bet it's like three or four because Perfect. we use Skype a lot so there's a lot more communication going across in group chats so they're able to figure out problems and get them solved uh, but inside of the email component it really is up to the PM to work with the team lead to figure out how that gets resolved and what the next steps are versus having every person on that email and every person involved. So it's really cleaned up their process. So they are focused 90% of their day. Nice. And then nice. on our side, everybody else has to kind of work through more of the problems being more active as well. But I do find that when you start to pull some of that back, it actually makes it a little more exciting. And, and your response time is, is almost indicative of how fast you actually respond to people. <laughs> if you're always responding quickly, it's game that you have to respond always quickly. <laughs> And You've because I'm that. terrible at it, it yeah. works out even better. Not that I want to push this out there, but if I can't respond and it's five, six, seven hours, two days later, they actually feel more comfortable because they still know you're on it because they're going to get a response from you at some point in time. So it's kind of like when your first friend texts you and they're like, why didn't you respond back to me? I know you read it. And you're like, oh, I, I can see you read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To achieve a life, like why are you reading that I and read? Then eventually, message? everybody gets comfortable with it, right? And they're just like, yeah. he won't respond. He'll get back to you tomorrow. So you kind of build up that. It sounds terrible, but really, it's, it's you're, you're doing other things. You're people to be... how to re engage with you, not only in business but also in life. Yep. When my my family and friends and everyone's like, yeah, like don't if you email Ricardo, it's fine, but he's not going to get back to you. It's like it's going to be a day before he touches that again, yeah. and. They've just grown to accept that. I said, if you want to reach me, call me on my phone. I said, I answer the phone. And all my numbers in there, I see who it is. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? If my mom calls, I'm like, hey, mom, can't talk. I'm in the middle of something, but everything's good. All right, I'll call you back. But they've learned that if you email me, it's fine. You'll get an, a response. Maybe. Most of the time, I'm aggressive with that delete button. I'm Literally, like, delete read this? No. Yeah. I'm, and I like short emails. I'm like, I'm... If it's past the screen, I'm like automatically deleting. I don't care what it is. Brevity I'm is like, respect. Oh man, I'm like, dude, if it's, I have a big screen and if it goes past the screen, I'm like, you clearly haven't figured out what you want to see. Next. <laughs> it's true, it's kind of yeah. Harsh, but I get easily a hundred emails a day, a day. And when I did, what had me take this sort of harsh sort of line with this is that I installed this app on my computer to track everything I'm doing. So every time rescue I open time? a screen, rescue time, awesome. beautiful app. And <clears throat> it's a free version. Go on the rescue time, I think.com, just Google it. And if someone finds it, please paste the link in the chat. And it tracks every window that's on the front. So everything in the back, it doesn't care about because you're not working on it anyway. And it's measuring how long you're in Facebook, how long you are opening email, how long you're opening up pages, when you're an illustrator, how many hours. And it's tracking everything. So at the end of the day, it gives you a nice little chart. Be like, you spent four hours in email. And you're like, whoa. And you start to see. And then you, I multiply that stuff out over weeks and months and years. And I said, what percentage of my year do I spend responding to people? And when you start to get into four months, five months, a year, Ooh. just responding to email, you're like, yeah, it's going to be a day before I get back. To, like, you understand the cost of that. Yeah. It's that was an interesting lesson I learned years ago. Cleaning like you, like you think of what could you do with four months off? You could could you write a book? You know, could you like could you do a blab? Could you do an interview? You could do tons of stuff. So I I was the way I learned this lesson was I was working in this restaurant years ago at, at college and I was cleaning out a mayonnaise jar. I was working in a restaurant. So I'm oh, there was some mayonnaise at the bottom. I didn't want to get my hand dirty, so I just threw it out. The manager comes, he goes, What are you doing? I'm like, Well, I want to get a new thing of mayonnaise. He goes, No, no, no. 
He's like, this mayonnaise at the bottom of that. I was like, come on, man. That's a little bit at the bottom. Who cares? You got a stacks of them in the back. Let's get a new one. He's like, no, no. He started scraping it and he's showing me and he filled it up and he filled up a couple ramekins. He goes, look at that. He said, there's three of them in there. He goes, you know how much mayonnaise I go through in a week? He goes, I go through a dozen of those containers a week. He said, if you threw out that much mayonnaise every time, times 12, times 52, he's like, you're literally taking hundreds of dollars and throwing it in the garbage. Wow. And when I started taking that principle and applying it to, thank you, Will, for posting that, applying that to my productivity and to responding to email and how much time am I spending on social media? And how much time am I spending here? I'm like, whoa, take those hours, multiply it out for a year, and then you get how much of your life you're dedicating to that stuff. So it really, uh, I got aggressive when I saw those numbers. I'm like, this is over. Because unless my job is email, it's no point. My job is doing design or doing branding or doing strategy or doing something else. So that's where I should spend my time instead of getting playing tag with you. I'm like, if it's that important, call me. You like find that, uh, I was going to say, do you find over time too that the way messages are now coming to you, and I find this in our instance, is that if somebody's looking for information on a new project or uh, mm -hmm. wants to meet, that the subject lines are becoming um, not maybe more abrupt, but they're more direct. So when you're going through them, you know which ones to respond to now versus what you used mm -hmm. to get, which was random everything. So even right. people are starting to, to see a lot of that. Um, I, and I may be a terrible at having something like 50,000 emails and 40,000 on red, but you, you, the ones that were red were the ones that you needed. And right. you're, you're being more precise on it, right? Because your, your team is being able to be more direct on, I need a response, so I got to do X in order to get that. So they've been trained over time to be able to figure that out. But then clients and businesses also are starting to find that, you know, if it comes in from this avenue, if it's social or if it's a link on your site or wherever that mm -hmm. information is coming from, it is being more alerted to you. So you're able to decipher through the things that you need to be more efficient too, right? Absolutely. Deep work. Thanks for posting that, Marie. The uh, another thing that I use is Slack. I love Slack. Do any of you use that? It's it's you create these little channels for the project because you're working on multiple projects. You're jumping between things. So I'd create a new channel for each project that I'm working on. So this one is client A, client B, client C. Uh, there's another one for Black in Canada. So not, like all the things that I'm working on where I'm connecting with people, whether it is uh, personal or professional, I put it into Slack. Like it might be we're planning a birthday, a surprise birthday party for mom. I'm putting my brothers and sisters into that so that we can have a conversation that's streamlined right in that zone. So I'm not leaving my computer or picking up my phone and changing my focus because it takes you 20, 30 minutes to get back to where you were. So that really helps streamline communication process, sharing files. I would add the client to that. So if they have questions, they know, don't email me. I said, put it into Slack. So everything starts to go down this very narrow funnel. So as I jump, like the phone rings and it's a client, and I'm like, hang on, let me get into your project. I open up Slack, I click on that link, and everything is right there. I open up your file folders, I got this stuff, and I'm in the client's world with the right conversations filtered, with the right files, like everything is sitting there. I can close it down, take another phone call, open up uh, another channel and be right in that world so that I am practicing that deep focus uh, to, to be more productive because it's two, three hours of doing that. You could be to take time off, you know, I have a new baby. So spend more time <laughs> baby what's time. In, what's interesting about that too, though, is that uh, those no's and those, those rules can look so different for different people, right? Like you use your cell phone with your clients. I never use my phone with clients. Like I never give them my cell phone. Um, but everything happens in say Asana or Basecamp or that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll set up the Asana notifications to only go out once a day. So Tell it, me about that. Yeah. So um, instead of getting an alert every time the client adds something to the project, it. it's basically sent as a roundup post that's that comes in one email. See a list that you can... <laughs> Here's what happened today. Um, I give it to them as an emergency, like if they need it, but I don't ever kind of maintain any actual back and forth communication. And that might be different because maybe most of your clients are local. Maybe, maybe they actually live in Toronto where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so... 
I think it's totally fine, whatever your system is, as long as you're just really clear about it and really consistent about it and know how you're going to be the most productive, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Consistency is key, right? Because it pushes all the way through all your teams. So they kind of have to follow with, uh, along how it's working too. So like using the systems of us, uh, we have our own products. So we wanted to build efficiency in our business. So instead of opening 12 products to work on a project, we created Swivel. So you had one project, one product to do everything in. And then we needed a CRM. So we created Simplify. So we did things that were allowing us to be more efficient on our own end. Um, and then that allowed us to communicate. We used other products like Skype. But these things were always built to make us be quicker, faster, and, and more efficient. Um, on the cell phone thing, um, everybody can send me a phone me, text me, email me. The problem is, and, and I don't like to admit this, but I'm sure everybody would say it, but I'm terrible at answering the phone. I, I'm not, my phone has been on mute it's for like 20 you years. You have to work this muscle just to slide to unlock that. That is it, buddy. This is. This yeah. is I just, you know what it is? I'd rather be personal and sitting down and talking with everybody. Obviously, yeah. in this case, I feel like we are. But um, the text thing, I love text because it's short and to the point like, hey, call me. It's a client. So I love that when they do that and, and I'll certainly go out of that way. But just for random calls, it's I find it harder for me because it could be in a million things, right? So it, balancing that out. But again, it's your time, right? It's I find as I've gotten older that it's more about my thinking time of what I need to do next versus go, go, go. And then at six o'clock when you're going to go do all those emails, you're kind of exhausted because you've been going since six o'clock in the morning. So mm -hmm. are you really being as efficient at six o'clock at night to go through those 8 million uh, messages that you might've missed some nuggets that were amazing. Right. So right. I guess there's gotta be a way that you balance it and we all find our ways. And once you get into that groove, then you rock star and you're, you're pretty comfortable. Right. Yeah. So. And, and that's why that that article or that you know the weekly ideal week is is a work in progress because I'll learn things exactly. like oh I, I can't have more than three client meetings in a day or you know three mentorship calls in a day or I'm drained um, and that like I actually find email is like a low energy task for me and so mm. I can get those done really really quickly in the yeah. evening if I want to and so if I have three calls in the morning and I my brain is spent. Cool. Now I'm processing email and that's really easy for me, but that might not be the case for someone else. So I just think exactly you know, adjusting your schedule, always knowing how you work. I so. agonize over email. I could be there for an hour trying to compose one thing and I'm thinking about, oh, it's killing Overthink, me. Overthinking it. I'm <laughs> thinking of it. So Email's the best at midnight or 6 a.m. <laughs> It is because you can just because you're just, like so drained and you're just like blah blah blah. I don't even blah, know what makes no. I'm out. Yeah. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Rashim? Thanks for joining us. Glad you're here. Who else do we have in the room today? If people have questions, remember you can always post them on the side or even jump in the seat. Uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So, how important is it knowing yourself? Like we're talking about customizing your schedule, custom, like I like phone, I hate the phone. It is like, <laughs> how important is it to do a little, you know, self hug, a little personal development to understand what it is that you do best and the way you work best and then communicating that? I think it's everything. Um, again, like a, time management. If, we, if yeah. we think about saying no in terms of clients, like how, how do you, how do you know which client is going to resonate best with you? I think um, the more, you know, your own triggers, your own strengths, your own weaknesses, how you work best, um, how to talk about what you do best. Um, I think it takes a lot of, of self-discovery and, and personal development to really have that language um, so that even the copy that you're writing on your site says, hey, client, like that you can actually speak directly to them. And those clients, they come through the door because they read your copy and they're like, yep, I, I totally want this girl. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think you have to be so clear about what it is that you're you're strong at and what it is that you're you're not strong at. So I know I'm I'm very touchy feely with clients. Like I'll be like, love Marie. Like I sign off my <laughs> like the clients that come to me are the ones that are very um I love that. They love that. They're more like a friend. Um they trust me. It's it's like a long term supportive relationship. Yeah. So I don't I don't do quick quick and dirty projects. Um rush jobs like that's that's not my style and that took a long time to figure that out right mm -hmm. i had to do a few before i was like wait a second this is not it's not bringing out the best in me the client's not getting the best out of me um and if i want you know i'm sure you guys are in the same boat your work comes from word of mouth or so much of it does so you want to keep those relationships really strong they're the ones that are referring you to other people um so you you kind of owe it to everybody to to know yourself well enough to 
to bring the right people in the door and say no to the ones that you already know are either going to be a pain in the ass or they don't align properly with with the way you do what you do. And, and on that point, how do you say no to clients? Like, do you have any tricks? Is that easier as time goes on? Because it's not easy for me. I hate I hate disappointing yeah. people. I want to help everyone. But they're yeah, just... it's hard. Like, I don't think it I think it's ever easy to say no. Sometimes it is. Maybe Never you're like, this is no. definitely not a good fit. Um, <laughs> I, I try to just be like succinct, polite, um, you know, like, I, I don't know if I'm the best fit for your project. I'm happy to recommend you. I usually try to recommend at least three people who I think would be a good fit. Um, you know, if I can't do that, then I might say like, you know, sorry, uh, we're just, we're not able to take on any new projects right now. We're, we're booked up. Like sometimes it, you can't really argue with someone's time if they say like right. we just don't have that availability the only time that can backfire is when you say like oh i'm not available till like next spring and they're like cool i'll wait I'm like, don't wait damn it so <laughs> I, I know ben takes a much more direct approach where he's just like no just say no don't even don't even leave that door open right uh, but so, sometimes i'll use time as an excuse but i try to be pretty honest and just polite and and kind of keep it short and sweet cool Hey, on that note, Ben, if you want to jump in and talk about that direct approach, I would love that. He's so, so good at being direct. Oh, come on, it Ben. It turns me inside out. I'm like, oh, how do I how do I craft this without <laughs> sounding like a jerk? <laughs> if you want to jump in, Ben, please do. We'd love to hear about that. Jeffrey, continue. You were going to say. They do say that, though. There was an article that recently mm -hmm. came out that, uh, around Canadians that were too nice. We don't know how to say no. We don't know how to um, make make a statement or be bold about something because mm. we kind of, I guess they say we kick tires because of the fact that we just can't tell, you no know, or it's not going to work because we want to help. We're, we're always trying to be as helpful as possible. Right. So I think that if you do look at some of the things that you're talking about, a lot of that makes sense that when you have somebody that is more direct and you have somebody that's always willing to help that direct person offsets it quite well. And in the case of even on our team, I'll be like, yeah, we can do that. We'll check into it. And then it'll go to the team. The team's like, we don't have the scale. We can't do it. And then it's just a quick text. Yep, can't help makes you. Makes it easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thought we had the skills or thought we could help you. We don't have the time. Won't work. But we have to assess everything. You always want to see if you can be helpful. But there's other things that just don't even fit in at all. And you're like, you know what? I really don't even yeah. think we can even look at this because it's not going to help you. So yeah. um, I like the approach of being able to offer uh, three other people that could help. Um, a lot of the times that uh, we try, but uh, sometimes the skill set, like trying to find COBOL developers is uh, a little tough these days, but um, like that kind of thing, we don't always get um, yeah. accessible to, right. but yeah, I, I agree. I think that's the best. If you can still help somebody move forward, then uh, it helps everybody, right? The old, yeah. the old pass cool. the buckaroo and get someone yeah. to help them. And I've had, I've had a few of my, my students in digital strategy school that really struggled with, uh, like, what do I say? Like, I want to say no to this person, but I, I don't want to sound like an asshole. Um, and I thought, how would you feel if you applied to work at a service provider and they told you that they weren't available to work with you? Would you think they were an asshole? Or or what if they, they charge too much money? You know, they're like, I'm so afraid if I charge too much money on this proposal, they're going to they're gonna think I'm an asshole. And I was like, if, if someone charged you too much money or, or gave you a quote that was out of your budget, I mean, my reaction would be like, oh, wow, like I can't afford that person. They yeah. must be really good. And then you go off and you find someone within your budget. But it's not like I'm thinking they're a total jerk for, for charging what they feel they're worth, you know? So just, just getting people comfortable with like, you know, Price. saying no doesn't make you an a-hole. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. But it's also how you say no. Like yeah. you just made a great point is that when you said about your value or your price point, um, a few years ago, I guess while we were working with different clients, we would always have, this is what we go in with. And you always seem to compromise because you felt, well, maybe I should help you out and you'll do X and Y. And we decided that the no to us was putting our foot down was saying, you know what, we can't compromise because we're at a backlog. And in order for to put this into our cycle and to be able to manage all of this, the best way to do it is to stick to our guns and say, this is how we operate. This is the, the structure we have to stick to because we've lived through too many of the past mistakes. And we said, if we stick to our guns and this is the, mm -hmm. the output and the, the input that we want to take, it actually made our, our business and our life a thousand times easier because businesses, people started to respect that. Oh, this is your line. And we never had to go across that line. We didn't have to go back and forth anymore. 
And it actually made it easier. And we're like, so work would turn itself down because, like you said, the price point might have been too high, but they didn't look at it as a bad thing. They'd come to us later for something else. Absolutely. But we stuck to our guns and it, and it did actually make a big difference in how we operated. Wow. So putting in those structures, saying no, uh, keeping it sort of neat and clean down the middle. Uh, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm good at. This is how we're going to do it. This, I'm not going to answer your phone call. Like laying that all out actually increased all of your businesses. Yeah. For sure. Wow. So I know most people starting out or people in business, especially in the first couple of years, would be like, my God, like, I don't want to say no to anybody. I want to cast my net as wide as possible. I want to get every, everybody's my clients. You get these people that go, uh-huh. who's your client? Everybody. And you're like, no, everybody's not your client. I have never bought your product. And I mean, this is this is direct evidence that actually getting that focus in, saying no, this is when I'm not going to answer the phone. I will do text. I'll send you when I love you. I won't do this. It's you know, it's like really focusing on who you are and what you bring to the table on your best skill sets actually drive business up. Have any of you had found an increase in your pricing or profitability because of that? I I mean, I assume so. Um... <laughs> I, I guess it's hard to raise prices. Like you say, you know, we're doing yeah. this and the prices just kept going up. Not necessarily directly correlated to that, but there's a... Well, I think when you're, when you get really specific about what you do and who you do it for and who you don't do it for, yeah. um, when your positioning is really strong, you actually get more people coming through the door, mm-hmm. right? So like, I actually found once I was really clear and like, no, I only work with like this type of person or this group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, Raising the prices actually brought in more inquiries as well. So I actually had to say no more often, but it, I also brought in more revenue and you, be, you become more in demand, right? right. Um, and I always like to, to challenge people to think about if you wanted to overhear a friend describe you to someone, like when you're not in the room, like, oh, Ricardo, he's the guy that does blank. Like, what do you want them to say? Mm. It, Otherwise, if it's like, yeah, like he does a bit of like web design, I think he also does some social media stuff and he's kind of like that. No one remembers that, right? Like right. it's so if, generic. It's just like, whatever. It's like, if you say, if you say th- uh, three things, they don't like, nobody remembers it. If you say one thing, they remember it. So you have to say that one thing, what it's like seven times. Like it takes someone like 27 en- or something encountering you, like, social, yeah. Yeah, like, t- like seeing you seven times and, and kind of remembering what you do seven times before they're like, oh yeah, she's the one that does that. So if they encounter you seven times and like five of those times are, t- are like totally different things, it's really hard. To get- part of them. <laughs> it's like, cool. She's the one that you give her money and she'll like do whatever you, you right. tell her to do. Like it doesn't make any sense. So I think when you're really, really clear on what you, what you are really great at and what you will do and what you won't do, um, it makes it way easier to charge premium prices. Cause it's like, yes, she is a go-to person for that thing specifically. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you can't do the other things that you that you love, because I know a lot of people have, you know, lots of other passions that they love doing. It just means that in your like your marketing is going to get so much easier, right? It's like it's kind of like they call it backdoor marketing. Like you can still get in a conversation with someone and be like, oh yeah, like I can also handle that for you, but you don't need like 20 different services listed on your website. Like, don't worry, I do all of it. Like, just in case you have money for that. So that's my spiel on that. It's very true. And, and I think the, the only piece that I would add into that is that when you first start, you almost have to do that. It's, it's yeah. a rite of passage. You have to do everything. As much as you're going to say you're going to do one thing, you're not known for one thing, but you're not known for anything. I agree so you can't that. really make a mark right. until you made a mark. So yeah. the only way to make a mark is to get out there and do a lot do of stuff. Work. <laughs> is. You're going to do a lot of things and you're, you know, they always say the hockey curve where I changed my direction or pivot. I pivot. Everybody's always pivot. I pivoted again. <laughs> well, you didn't pivot. You just were doing everything and you found the thing that actually <laughs> worked. Scaling back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just scaled back because of your time. And that didn't happen in day one. I didn't start a website and be like, hey, I'm going to do X and everything else. I'm not doing it out of my face. It, it's yeah. never been the case, right? It, you know, I, I watched this, um, I can't remember their, her name, Mike. It's terrible because uh, she's famous, but she sold her uh, website to AOL. Um, and I can picture her right now. Huff- Ariana Lady. Huffington. Yeah, Huffington. I watched Huffington, Huffington speak. Post. Yeah. And she did this big chat about how we need to get more sleep and how we need to make more time yeah. for ourselves. This was like to the top. six years ago or so, eight years ago. 
And I sat there thinking, I'm like, that's amazing. You're right. But how am I going to do that when I just started yesterday? Like, <laughs> I'm going to work nine to five and I'm only work Mondays and Wednesdays. And I'm not going to. And I was like, that's not going to happen. I'm never going to pay a bill. I'm going to be broken living in a gutter. Like, give me a break. Yeah. So, like, there's there's a time frame for everything, I think. And I think that's one of the things we got to keep in mind is that when you started the first one to two years, you were making a name by doing everything. And then you pivoted to doing what you were it's good at. It's the internship right. phase, right? It's like right. everyone it has totally. to go through that internship phase. Yep. Yeah. And you can't avoid it unless you're like Snapchat and you come up with a great one-time product or whatever the product is. A little different. So if you're not going to be one of those and you have to refine yourself, I think we got to go through that process unless you come up with one idea and you got four clients that fit that and then you're good to go, right? So yeah. I think you throw that timeline in there, it really yeah. does help and allows us as business owners to eventually streamline that and then be able to say no and, and be more effective and efficient in time too. So. And I think tying into to Ricardo, your your comment about knowing yourself is when you're in that internship phase, just listening and watching, like where are projects going really well? What's falling through the cracks? Uh, what's really difficult for me? What comes really, really easy? And just like taking notes or doing debriefs after every single project, like what, like where is there friction? Where do things just feel really easy? And you can start to hone in and kind of um, listen to what people are saying about you and to you. What are your clients thanking you for? All that stuff because you can, you can. It's, it takes time, right? You go through your internship phase, yeah. but you're gonna start you to put in the thousand days to really listen yeah. to what what people are really saying uh, in Definitely. response to what it is you're doing. So it's so I guess you have to start off with a hot mess. It's yep. gotta be white. You <laughs> shake a lot of hands, make a lot of kiss friends, a lot of babies, yeah. <laughs> kiss a lot of babies, and, and as you, you come out of that, you know they say at the three year mark is when you sort of settle in business to say, okay, now. I'm in. I've gone too far down this hole to go back and do something else. I'm actually going full steam. Yeah. Three years, a thousand days of mm -hmm. just doing, you know, being self-employed or whatever it is. And then at that point, you'll figure out what it is that you're going to do next, or what it is that you're actually doing in business. And you start to, to, to thin and this I, thing And I think out. the beauty too with even positioning is positioning can evolve, but rather than taking on 10 positions at one time, yeah. um, you know, you can, you can, maintain a certain position or a certain, you know, uh, position in the market or like I do this and that can kind of slowly evolve. And if th in three years time, you're like, actually, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to do something a little different. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, so I think, you know, people are going to take on many different positions in the course of their, their lifetime and in their careers, but to do 10 at once and be like, I do this and this and this and this, you're not going to get traction anywhere. So better to get traction in one area, then pivot, get more traction. Um, everything will kind of lead up to, you know, this big, Right. course of your career but i think you got to be focused and what about your network over this time as you're meeting these people along the way and you're connecting you're shaking hands you're getting linkedin everything's growing what do you do when you pivot how do you let people know that you've moved you've changed i'm no longer doing x and i'm starting to do one two three how do you uh do you have any have you ever done that before and what would you recommend someone do yeah, like I guess I'm sort of in that position now, right? Like I uh, was a designer myself and then evolved digital strategy school and now I'm doing product development, right? So um, sometimes I do feel like I have these two different audiences and kind of how do you balance and manage that? Um, it's nice when you can find the areas of overlap, right? So where can this product help these students or mm -hmm. what can I take from what I'm learning in the product development space and bring it to what designers can learn and kind of bring to their clients as well. So um, I think being, op for me, being open and transparent about what you're working on, what the struggles are, whether it's blogging about it, um, there's always something to be learned in every experience that we're going through. So I'm just sort of, I share, I share whatever, I share the struggles, I share, you know, what's working really well, like this is really hard. Um, and I, I, I feel like I'm able to find the patterns of like, what can I take from product development space and the MVP process? And how do I, what can I, what can I teach designers about that? Right? Like, can you take an MVP process with your clients? Like, what could that look like? Right. Um, I know that people's pivots won't always necessarily be, um, be so seamless that way, but I just think being honest about what you're learning and what you're working in. So um, a question for you, Marie, on the side from yeah. Lex, what's your, so I, uh, what was your major? I have a bachelor of design, graphic design. Um, so I did design for many years and then uh, I ended up taking a job at a digital strategy agency and I started learning way more about the marketing and strategy side of things. And I saw that so many solo designers didn't have that insight. So I was like, how can I take what they're doing at an agency level mm -hmm. um, and bring it 
make it more digestible and bring it more to the solo designer space. Um, and then, yeah, the product on the product development side, we're building an app that allows people to deliver online courses. So it's it's it can be related in some ways. Like there's lots of designers that also want to teach a branding course or, you yeah. know, um, teach a code course or that sort of thing. And so there's there's some overlap there, but it's still kind of uh, running a SaaS business is very different than, say, running, you know, a design business or a mentorship. Business. So what's what what is SaaS, first of all, for the because you're throwing some acronyms around. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're so deep into yeah. So what is a SaaS business? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's software as a service. So basically people pay like a monthly subscription fee to be able to uh, use the platform. Um, yeah. So it's a okay. licensed software. So you have a product that's on people are paying your monthlies. Yeah. So they get access, access to, to the platform. They can, um, you know, create courses and, and deliver them and sell them through the platform. So we handle like the email integration, the payment integration, all of those details in one place. So, so you're like Google, you're providing like a we Gmail for, yeah. <laughs> but you know, just a small G in the Google, not a big yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What about you? What about you, Jeff? What did you take at school? Man? Uh, I've been all over the board though. My, uh, <laughs> I've never focused strictly on and one thing. I wanted to learn about everything. So I have uh, international business, postgraduate in electronic commerce, uh, degree in um, uh, political science, commerce, and then com yeah. computer science. So I've I've been around the block. So um, I kind of enjoy school, or I guess, or learning. So, uh, but one of the things I found fascinating that uh, I have to share was that. Probably in year two that I, when I started, I was at a, a wedding and there was an entrepreneur that was there. And 10 years ago, entrepreneurs were kind of like a rare thing uh, because people were like, you're an entrepreneur. I'm not bringing your product in here. You'll be out of business in a year. That was kind of the mentality, yeah, right? right? So it was a tougher kind of break into the market. Nowadays, everybody's like, you're an entrepreneur. What are you doing? Make it in here. Like everybody's pretty excited. Cohorts, loves all the startup. Oh, you have no experience. Come on in. You're like, what? Yeah, exactly. What, what yeah. just happened? It's amazing, a different experience. But so when I had started this, this gentleman said to me, he goes, uh, you know, he was excited that I was on my own. And what he said was that you won't know you're a business until you've been in business for five years. And that's when he said that you'll be a business. And because you have a high rate of 80% of businesses that were crash out after a year or two, um, you know, and he'd been doing it for a long time. So that actually resonated with me and it stuck with me for a long time. And when I finally got to year five, I was like, yeah, I finally got here. I'm a real business. <laughs> I'm a real business. I made yeah, it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm a real boy. Like, it was <laughs> kind of weird, right? <laughs> it's like, like a little badge. It's yeah, a little badge. Yeah, that's what was good. <laughs> and it was because for the first few years, I couldn't even tell people in my own network that I ran my own company because I was um, more afraid of the failure side of it, of not being able to succeed in what we were doing. Probably, like you said, not knowing yourself, not knowing that we were a business, it was like that was the part that made you feel like you're a real business. So uh, it kind of made a big difference in, in all of that, too. So, um, yeah. So I just it's almost like those first stuff. five years are, are internship level. Right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it really is. Trying to find your way and figure out who you are, what your business is about, and then refining, 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 right? Until you get to that yeah. key piece that people can, because people really think of one thing. They don't think of three things about you, like you said. Right. When they think of one thing, it's that one thing they're going to remember you for. And that is really nice guy or really good at software or really good at creative. When they remember you for that, that's what they'll tell people. And that's what comes back to you. So if your site and everything has a million things, no one can define who you are. So they don't really think that, you know, everybody thinks you can only be good at one thing in life. Yeah. So you kind of have to take that in. And once you're good at that one thing, then you can balance time, effort, and anything else that goes on in your business because you're good at one thing. What if you're good at multiple things? <laughs> I think you can. <laughs> Don't be. go to I'm all for that. <laughs> but the problem is, is that you can't remember that, right? Like Ricardo, he's great at X, and uh, Marie's great at this. It's the problem is, is that we all have a one-track mind. Like I want an email guy. I don't want the guy that does text. I need an email guy. So right. that's where the the concerning part is that people don't believe that and trying to convince people that you can do those things makes it even harder, right? Like if I sat in a room with all these business people trying to tell them that, no, we do both. We're really good at both. It, it's hard to convince them of that, right? Because they think still in this old school way that you can only do one thing and that resources only allow you to do one thing. So eventually, like an Oracle, an IBM, and a Google, they become good at a million things, but they started off good at one thing. 
and then they branched off to do everything else. Mm. So once you get known, then you can start to eat the pie, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the the entry entry gate is sort of like like I do <laughs> the one thing. It's a turn style is one at a time, one at a yeah, time. Yeah, you know, once you get through, then you know, cause and, I still feel like a generalist too, right? Like yeah. I still do lots of things, but it's sort of the the frame through which you describe it is is one anchor, you know. Yep. And do you want to be outside a generalist? I find that if I'm not a generalist, I can't help clients. Because then I'm gonna have to yeah. be like, hey, let me make a phone call. I gotta get a hold of the email guy and see what he thinks. <laughs> yeah. You know, I gotta get a hold of the marketing lady and see what she thinks. Like to me, if you can't speak to all of them, how are you really gonna solve a problem? And we're solutionists. So if I can't solve the problem, then uh, I feel exactly. like I'm not doing it justice to the business. So so if, what I let me let me try and wrap this up because what I think I'm hearing is that you have to be known for one thing, but you have to know many things. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, totally. That's, that's an interesting way to, it's the first time I sort of saw that. But even in inside of a business, right? You know a million things in your own business because you wear a lot of hats, but nobody else knows that because they don't know the things that you have to do in order to run your business. So it becomes yeah. fascinating how you do a million things. And then when you're with a client, you probably don't even realize you're like, no, we're just do design. But then when you're in there, you're solutioning out every facet that they're like, not even thinking of, right? Close thing to this, like all yeah. these other yeah. SEO, so we're all you doing right? all sorts of stuff that, yeah. So, so we're generalists. That's it. We are, we are generalists that are known for one thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. A generalist specialist, right? It's yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah if you ask me yeah. to introduce myself, I'm a specialist, but I'm actually entrepreneurs are generalists because they do everything from takeout checks, from writing checks to taking out trash. Yeah. Yep. Everything in between, like anything breaks in a company, uh, most entrepreneurs today are like jumping right in the trenches, and they can do it. Uh, make something happen. And I'm sure, you know, we're all that way. And, you know, we like to get our hands dirty with code and jumping in there and, okay, okay, let them do it. It's like, <laughs> but well, it's I think true. Having, having some level of experience in certain areas, it makes it easier to hire the help too, right? Like right. you can speak the language, you know, what's missing. You can, you can, you know what it takes to even do the job. Line. So you yeah. can like, okay, this is going to take X number of hours to do go nuts. Or they're like, well, it's been six weeks. And you're like, that's like, putting a plugin in WordPress. Come on, like, yeah, <laughs> it's really complicated. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Calling them out on it. I like you're it. You're fired. You know. <laughs> but but yeah, that that you know that that makes a good entrepreneur. That makes a good person in business. That you actually know what it takes to do the job. You just can't be the one doing it all the time. So, yeah, we are at about exactly one hour so sweet and it's the perfect time to wrap things up if everyone would like to follow marie and jeffrey i've put their twitter links on the side uh if you have any questions or want to jump in at something right now now would Thanks. be the time we have a couple of minutes maybe one minute lots of love if you like what they had to say mm -hmm. and you like this topic please share about it I feel yes. like I can talk to you guys all night. Like, I'm like, okay, we're keeping this thing exact an hour and having to like lock this thing in. So I know these things always go so Fine, be that way. Be that yeah. way. I know we'll have to wrap it up. There's this thing called a podcast that we're doing. Let's try to keep it in the. I'm but just going to send so you a lot of email and text. That's oh, it. Yeah. I'll be flying 24 to 48 hours. That's what's going to come up. So we have someone calling in. Uh, he's been very active in the chat. So let's uh, see what he has to say. He's been loving what we've been talking about. What's up, Lex? Welcome. Oh, this is more people like y'all. I'm sorry. I'm in my bedroom watching the news. And while I'm doing that, I just happen to come in. Yo, Ricardo, where do you find these people from? You need to find more like them. The world will be a better place. Stop. No, stop. That's true. Thank you. Come on. Hey, and Ricardo, I got you off the, uh, I followed you off the other blab. Uh, let me turn down a little bit. Yeah, man. Um, incredible. Y'all yeah, remind me of casting crew on location and stuff like that and prior projects and things that I've worked on. I mean, it's like incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Do this again. I will. I will. I will, sure I will be quiet. I will be quiet. I will listen. <laughs> <laughs> I won't digress. Lex is on this side. Lex was like, "Yep, I agree. This is good. This is good." <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. The word, the word that I keep hearing on here in productive labs is skill set. Mm. Skill set. So I'm actually learning, 
and um, as you can see, the grays, you know, <laughs> they, they the wisdom. But you know, I, I, I keep I keep an open mind. Good. And um, <clears throat> no man, forget about it. Incredible. I just came in to thank you. Ricardo, find, find like 10 more like this and the world will be a better place, man. I'm telling you. This is my goal, my friend. This is my goal. I'm trying to get great people. You better call me. Have the conversation. You better call me, Ricardo. <laughs> We're going to connect on live. We're going to hook up. We'll see you again, man. We're going to be friends. Thank you. I'm going to bounce out. Thank you. I just wanted to share that with y'all. Next time you do this again, I will definitely come by and I'll learn something. Thank Where you. are you from, Lex? Awesome. Where, I, I, where I'm, are you from? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. The Empire New State. City. Yes. Awesome. No way, hold on. Right. Say it right. Say it right. New York fucking city. Very <laughs> <laughs> hated. New York. Get out Everybody of here. Loves New York. Come on. New York's the best. I love We're, New York. I'm coming to New York in like a week. <laughs> um, I'm there for a wedding in about on the first week of July. On the first week of July, I got to look on my schedule. I'll look on my schedule. If you're not doing anything, we'll probably go to the Shark Bar. Right on Amsterdam and 76th Street. <laughs> I guess we got nothing to do when I'm in New York. <laughs> no, no, wait. Hi. I'll, I'll, you know I'll, my time will be tight. I'll be there for a wedding, but if you're I know. in New York, we'll definitely connect. No, no, no. We'll, do a, blab. we'll, do, we'll do a blab from New York. Whoa. If that is because then I have to get on my Android, I don't even know where it's at. I like the S5. The 6 and the 7 sucks. S5 right. is the best galaxy, but I digress. Thank you. Let me let y'all wrap this up. Uh, you better call me, Carl. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, John. We'll connect. Thanks, Lab. Thank All right, man. You, Cheers, Cheers, man. <laughs> I love Vlad, man. That's you meet the best awesome. people. Out the best. Yeah, that was awesome. So, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is the end of this episode of the Framing Podcast, and we will look forward to seeing you next time on the interwebs. <laughs>